The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. In this episode of Postcards... Uh, the next thing you know, all I saw was water, so we invaded that southern France. It's really satisfying to take these old instruments and make something useful and beautiful out of them and, and fun. I, I guess I try to be an artist as I want to be, as I, uh, and I paint the same things what I used to paint back in Russia. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave. At the Fagan Fighters World War II Museum in Granite Falls, U.S. Army veteran Horace Larson tells us his story of serving in World War II. I was uh, actually started out as a supply sergeant, but then some corporal needed uh, uh, some men, and I was just a serial number. So I went to the infantry and uh, picked to go out on cadre to train another division. And uh, of course I did that and uh, the next thing you know, all I saw was water. And then I saw the signals up in the Straits of Gibraltar, way up, so we invaded at southern France. I got some of Hitler's private stationery I, uh, and uh, I captured the, the biggest uh, uh, SS officer, uh, oh, someplace up in the Alsace Mountains there. We went looking for a plane we shot down and uh, uh, stumbled upon a cabin, uh, if you please, or a house. Uh, up in the mountains, and when we were looting it, if you please, uh, looking for stuff, uh, jewelry and uh, all kinds of things, uh, I see a picture of this SS officer, you know, in the photo albums that they had there, uh, uh, these people. Then it had snowed, I could see tracks leading out of there. So then, of course, I told Harry Olson, my, one of my men, I said, you cover me. I see his tracks led out. And he ducked his uh, uh, Luger, his pistol, uh, oh, underneath the building. And uh, of course, I re retrieved that. And then I uh, took off and, you know, over there, like in Norway or any other place, they have the house they live in and a courtyard and uh, hay and uh, straw or whatever. And uh, I, I could see his tracks going up that way. So I told him, uh, uh, come and see you with the hunden up. Come on out with your hands up. 
nothing happened. So I, uh, I said, "Is Sagan come and see you with holding up?" And I fired up two, three rounds up high. I didn't want to kill him. And uh, then he came out. So uh, of course they took him up to prisoner of war, had him standing by a fence with guards, uh, guns pointing on him. The Lion Companies, they're the ones that had the brunt of the, of the battle, but uh, we used to see the bombers you know, flying, and we uh, thank God that uh, they were ours, you know. Uh, and we saw fighter planes escorting them, but they were way up high. So uh, uh, the Luftwaffe was almost extinct, you know, at that time. So uh, uh, we didn't, uh, you know, see any dog fights. I didn't anyway, uh, or anything like that. So and uh, liberated. Uh, uh, I think it was Buchenwald prison camp. We came in, there was a train standing there, cars, and it had bodies, you know, just uh, stacked up in them. Uh, many of them, men, women, thrown in there. It was so skinny, it was just skin and bones. And, uh, and of course, when we came in, they tried to climb the electric fence, and there was a ball of fire. They'd fall down in the moat, and we saw, uh, you know, three and four in a group, and we'd throw them uh, some cheese and bacon that came in a ration, uh, you know, because they'd almost fight themselves amongst them to get a taste of something to eat. I was in Patch's Seventh Army to start out, but then they switched us over to Patton's Third Army. So we fought with him then all the way down. Uh, into almost the Brenner Pass in Italy again. I only want to say that I didn't think I ever was that important. Uh, you know, you help, you're supposed to help your fellow man. And uh, I guess that's kind of what happened. Do you have an idea for the Postcards team? Email us, postcards at pioneer.org. Mark Fritas gives us a lesson in repurposed art, demonstrating how one man's trash is another man's treasure. Mark Freitas, and I'm a musician, and uh, I make instruments into lamps and other furniture items. I started doing this when I was in college, and I was working at a, another music store. And uh, so, a few months ago, I decided to start kind of expanding what I had done in the past, and, and uh, so we've started here with my job at Whitney Music it gives me access to a lot of old instruments. These are instruments that were just beat up, and basically we just had around here for parts. And so I'm able to uh, repair those a little bit and then you know, make them into a lamp or other items. When I start to make a lamp, I like to do some research about the instrument, find out when it was made or who it may have belonged to. If a person brings one to me, then I definitely want to hear the backstory. Um, and sometimes, again, it's been a, a, their own instrument or it maybe had been passed down through generations in their family. Uh, so that makes it very meaningful. Um, so once I determine you know, how old it is and what kind of level of instrument it was, if it was a, 
student level or a professional level or something like that. That kind of guides me in, you know, how I want to design the rest of the piece around it. This is a 1910 mellophone. It looks kind of like a French horn, but it's a little bit different, a little simpler kind of relative of the French horn. But uh, there's beautiful silver that has some beautiful engraving on it there. Now I'm wiring the, the socket here. You can see I already made this little thing here to for it to sit in and uh, just get it all wired up and then we can put the bulb in it, put the shade on it. One of the things that I really like doing about the, with these instruments too is that I make each lamp unique. So there are some when, when I was researching online, there are some companies that make lamps and they kind of make them all look alike. And I don't like that. I like to sort of go with the personality of each lamp or you know for a custom what a customer's decor might be or whatever and just really make each one unique. So this one didn't have this part right here. Um, Mellophones are are usually pitched in a couple different keys. They'll have like a little extra tuning slide or what they call the tuning bit right here, um, uh, so that they can be pitched in F or E flat or different things. Well, this one didn't have all that. And it didn't even have a mouthpiece and stuff. So I actually made this part, um, which is typical of what a horn like this would have, and I put the mouthpiece on it. So this much, this section right here, I made from scratch and then silver plated it to try to make it all blend in here. And, um, so that took a lot of work. And then just shining this thing up too, it was just black with tarnish. And so it took a lot of effort to get it looking like this. And I didn't even, I didn't try to get every bit of tarnish off of it because I spent a lot of time just getting it to this point. But then I lacquered it so that it'll stay shiny like this now. I really love working on antique and vintage instruments and uh, the craftsmanship back then, everything was done by hand and a lot of the instruments have beautiful ornate engraving on them and things like that which you don't find on instruments today. And so uh, that I think really adds to the beauty and the value of the instrument and then I think uh, that again helps me to decide, okay, well I want to give this one a special treatment. I want to make it look, you know, maybe from that period with the type of shade that I use on a lamp or the type of base that I make. I want it to all fit so that it's, uh, it really looks like a period piece. Well, a lot of the instruments that we get come from either customers or from schools and they'll bring them in and they'll just be past the point of being repaired, you know, and so uh, they'll just donate them to us or, or we'll give them a little bit of credit for the instrument. Um, and then it just gets put back here somewhere in the store and we will use it for parts. And so that's one way of repurposing, but then I got the idea of taking these instruments and then making them into lamps and other things. And uh, Bob Whitney was real happy to give me those, you know, to kind of help unclutter back here in the shop. And, um, and then we even have people giving me uh, pianos because now instead of taking an old piano that's not worth fixing, you know, taking it to the dump or something can be a beautiful piece of art and, and a functional piece. It's really satisfying to take these old instruments and make something useful and beautiful out of them and, and fun. You know, they can, some of my lamps are sort of whimsical looking and others are very classy and chic looking and others are somewhere in between. And so uh, uh, it's neat to take an instrument that maybe has just been sitting around for decades, just gathering dust, and then uh, make something beautiful out of it. Do you use Facebook, Twitter, or other social media? Connect with us to get immediate access to behind the scenes videos, reviews, and other postcards and pioneer news. Katya Andriva, a longtime resident of Granite Falls, shows us her unique style of painting at the Russian American Museum in Minneapolis. I came to America 
exactly 20 years ago, in 1994, and it was June. And so I came, I, I guess I tried to be an artist as I want to be, as I, uh, and I paint the same things what I used to paint back in Russia. People, <laughs> the flowers, the eggs, and eggs with Russian stories, uh, different seasons, and it was quite popular, it was surprisingly interesting for American and for Minnesotans. Yes, so it was great start for me, I guess. <laughs> came here to America and I guess illustration was become a big thing for me. And about 15 years ago I met uh, John Peterson and David Cashel. They offer to do the book with them. And it was my first book in 1999. We did a book called Meet Me in the Garden. They saw some of the of my art in the art Edina Art Fair. I had the pleasure of meeting Katya in 1999, and it was during the Edina Art Fair. Now, I had been playing the good husband role of going all over the art fair with my wife, and then all at once I said, "Hey, let's walk over here," and then my wife and I saw the most exquisite art that day that we had seen. And then I had the pleasure of meeting Katya and buying several of her paintings. And over the years, had become an avid Katya Andreeva collector. So that's how that happened. We've done 30 books with Katya, with Katya's art. And uh, one of the favorites is Secrets of the Vine. But my, my favorites are the children's books. I mean, th those are the ones that I think there's, there's a, a vibrancy to the art. And I particularly like to see the expressions on my nieces and nephews when they're looking at the art. Makes my day. Since I met the publishers, it's kind of become clear that something very interesting for me to do illustrations for the book for the books, all different kinds, inspirational, florals, children's books. So right now, the literature and poetry inspired my, my art a lot, and it's something very interesting because I have my personal interpretation of the characters and using different techniques. It used to be only watercolors in the past, and now I'm using mixed media. I'm adding some pastels and pencils and special printing collages and all kinds of things. It's getting more fun. And I'm thinking I'm getting even, I'm bringing more people with my art to me, those who are admire you know, not just a beautiful picture, but also some story behind it <laughs> and my personal view. So there's connection. <laughs> well, I think that there's a, a very strong, there's a, a vibrancy of emotion that comes through in the color that, uh, that really makes the art, for, for instance, with her children's work, there's just a, it makes you smile just to look at the art. So there's that strong emotional appeal to it, a feel-good emotion. That's what I like. Watercolor have a life itself. <laughs> and I guess um, the fact that I don't have to control it too much, kind of like I have a little conversation, because watercolor is an interesting technique. Depends on how much water and pigment of in your brush strokes you applied, the effect could be absolutely different. That's why I say I don't really plan exactly my images, what I'm gonna paint. They happened. Um, sometimes I just sit in front of the white piece of paper and it could admire me by itself, 
you just have to be quiet and look at that and start mixing paint and and it's just all start live and you you can you can see things happening you just have to I guess play the same game <laughs> You know, process of crea creativity, it's uh, for those who know how lifting it is. That's uh, probably the most exciting thing. I think we all know that little bit, right? In your job, the creativity, they come up with a story and how to put it together, right? So it's kind of for me the same thing, creation, you know, you doing something what hmm, nobody done before, right? <laughs> I'm going back down to Baltimore 
shoes and stockings down on the floor. Come on, gal, come along with me. Gonna take you down to Tennessee. Well, I woke me, don't you tell me so to crack a dust, your mama. Does she chew the back of now? Visit Pioneer.org for more information on postcards and other Pioneer productions. Pioneer On Demand has all of your favorite productions available to watch online at your convenience, including past episodes of postcards. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota. A relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave.